But let me take 15 minutes to remind you of what we have done so far. This is the season where the Lord has reminded us that he's coming again. So welcome to the simplicity of the gospel brought to you by the Pegwell Community Church on Christ, at Christ Church in Barbados. Find us on YouTube at the Pegwell Community Church of Barbados. Like us there and send these messages to as many people as you can because this is how we get the gospel out. Amen? Amen. So... Let me take 15 minutes to remind you that the Lord is reminding us that he's coming and that we should be ready. So when we think of his coming, we think of what we call in Pentecostal circles, the rapture. That is the next thing that is going to happen. The rapture. Let me show you what it is. First Thessalonians chapter 4, begin at verse 13, and it could happen before we leave this service. It is the next thing in the church's calendar. The Lord said, I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those people who have already died. Don't sorrow as though they have no hope. They do have hope if they die in the Lord. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even those who die in Jesus, God is going to bring with him. So God is going to raise everybody from the dead. Although your body has gone back to the earth, it's going to come up. How do we know that? Let's go back to verse 14. This is what it says. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also who die in Jesus, God is going to bring with him. Look at how it's going to happen. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, this is not a figment of my imagination. I'm saying this to you by the word of the Lord. That we who are alive, everybody say alive, let me know you're there. We who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord, we should not precede, precede those that are dead. This is what's going to happen. Look at the next verse. For the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout. You can't miss it. With the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead. The bodies are going to come back together. The dead in Christ will rise first. They're going to hook up with us who are alive. And we're all going to be caught up. That's where we get the word rapture. Caught up, rapture. We're going to be caught up together with them. They're not going to go ahead of us. Neither are we going ahead of them. But we'll be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with, with the Lord. So the Lord advises us to watch and be ready. For in such an hour as we think not, this is going to happen. So in view of the fact that the Lord is coming and he's coming soon. He doesn't have another 2,000 years. He's coming very soon. This leads us to the text that we have been nibbling at for the last four or five sermons. Titus chapter 2. The Lord is telling us what we ought to do in view of the fact that he is coming. He is coming very soon. This is what we should do. Titus chapter 2, and I am in verse 11. I'm going to go back to verse 1 quickly. I'm taking 15 minutes, and then I'm going to speak to you from the book of Romans. This is what the Lord said. For the grace of God that brings salvation, it is the grace of God. The word grace means unmerited favor. God, through his grace, has offered you salvation. The majority of human beings is rejecting it. Is rejecting. But the grace of God that, that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Nobody will have any excuse. Because the grace of God reaches every man jack on earth. Whether he could hear, whether he's blind, God has a way of speaking to people. But they reject it. But the grace of God that brings salvation have appeared to all men. And look what the grace of God does. If we are looking for the coming of the Lord and we are serious about making heaven, it says the grace of God teaches us a number of things. Number one, you have to deny ungodliness. There's too much ungodliness even in the church. But let's personalize it. There's too much ungodliness even in your own life. 
Denying ungodliness, number one. We should deny also worldly lust. We are lusting after everything. Lusting after the material things. Lusting after power. Lusting after money. Lusting after prestige. Lusting after education. The Lord said we should deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And we should live, this is, that's the negative, this is how we should live now. We should live soberly, having our thinking caps on. We should live soberly, righteously, doing that which is right, and godly. You don't see that today. Even in the church, you're not seeing that. And godly in this present world. There are those who are so heavenly good, that they're almost away sometime on earth. They're no earthly good. But the Lord said this is what we should do in this present world. But while we are doing this, while we, go back, while we are denying ungodliness, and while we are denying worldly lust, and trying to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, while we are doing that, at the same time, the next verse tells us something, that we should be looking, looking, present continuous we should be looking for that blessed hope what is this blessed hope it goes there the glorious appearing of the great god and our savior jesus christ it's going to be glorious it's going to be marvelous it's going to be wonderful those words cannot even express what's going to happen when jesus bursts those clouds and it comes but we should be looking question are you looking are you looking? Are you looking for that blessed hope? In the same chapter too, Paul doesn't want anybody at all to miss what is going on. So in verse 1, he said, Timothy, sorry, Titus, speak, open your mouth, and speak the things that are sound doctrine. The word sound means in the original Greek, hygienic uncontaminated there's a lot of unhygienic there are lots of contaminated words coming from the pulpit these days like two men can get married and two women can get married and all that kind of stuff and uh, once you save you always save you get saved at eight years old and if you live until 80 you can't lose your salvation which means that god takes away your ability to, to to make choices you hear a lot of contaminated things from the public you hear that if you come up in the prayer line and you can put a thousand dollars you'll get a thousand dollar prayer for healing and if you don't have a thousand you can put in 500 you'll get a 500 hundred dollar prayer for healing and if you can't make it empty it whatever is in your pocket and we will still give you a prayer for healing so many contaminated things are coming from the pulpit. But Titus is told, and I'm going to follow this word. I'm going to do exactly what Titus is told. To speak the things that are hygienic, uncontaminated doctrines. Speak those. What are those things? Look at verse 2. That the aged men in church should stop pussyfooting and be serious about their salvation. Because they, more than anybody else, could drop dead at any time. So the aged men should be sober. The word grave means serious or decent or decorous. The men in church, they should be temperate, not flying off the handle at any time. They should be sound in faith. They should be sound in charity. They should be sound in patience. That is for the older men in the church. Now for the older women in church that they likewise be in behavior as become holiness. So you talk holy, you dress holy, you think holy. If you're an elderly, elderly woman in church, while well, you're looking for the coming of the Lord, he said you've got to do this. You're not twiddling your thumbs. You're not spending all day before the television. You're not spending all day on the telephone. That you behave as become holiness. You should not age women. You should not be a false accuser. You should not be given to much wine. But you should be teachers, elderly women in church. You might not hold a microphone. You may not come on the pulpit. But you ought to be teachers of good things. What are some of those good things? Look at, let's look at the next verse. That you may teach the young women to be sober. You watch Kaduman and you know the young women are sober. You, you watch Kaduman, you know the young women are sober. You watch the, the, the divorce in the country, 
that even in the church, the rate is the same as in the world. You know young women are not sober. They're not thinking straight. They behave as though they're intoxicated. They're drunk all the time. But the older women must teach the young women to be sober. The older women must teach the young women to love their husbands. So to love your husband is something that ought to be taught. It does not happen automatically. And the aged women in church ought to do that. But if they don't love their husbands themselves, I don't know how they can teach somebody else how to love theirs. Because some, well, don't me ask for amen, so let me say it myself. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Aged women, not only that, that you must teach the younger women to love their children. It doesn't seem to me to be automatic. The aged women in church, but aged women, do you love yours? Is there a lot of child abuse? You still slapping children in their face? You still telling them you're a big head idiot, I'll cuff you around your head? No, 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 you can't teach anybody anything. That's the way the young people don't want to hear you. And you think that they're rebellious and they're pugnacious and all that. No, no, no. They look at your life and the way you live. They don't want to hear you at all. But let me run on because i got to get to this morning's message. You ought to teach the young women to be discreet. I mean, let me not meddle here. Let me go on. To be chaste, which is morally sound, morally pure. Age ladies, you teach the young ladies to be keepers at home. And that does not only mean washing clothes and washing dishes and sweeping the house. It means that you as the woman need, need to keep the house together, full of love, full of joy. But if you are the most miserable in the house, how on earth are you going to do that? By the way, all of these are things that you're doing while you're looking for the coming of the Lord. Don't say you're looking for the coming of the Lord and you're not doing this. You're living in Timbuktu. Teach the young people to be keepers at home. Teach them to be good. Well, something good to be good is something that ought to be taught as well. Because the word of God is right. I'm going to slip past this one real fast because I could spend a whole hour there. Teach the young women to be obedient to their own husbands. Nobody ain't obedient today because women lips tell you get all you can, get all your education, be somebody, be, be this, be that woman. And so no woman these days going home and be obedient to their husband, especially if she thinks that she has married down. I got my degree and I married a carpenter. I ain't married down. The carpenter is a man. He bring home more money than you. But you think because your friends, you married down. So you're not going to be obedient to him. That's why marriage is not working. So the Lord te said, the Lord, not me. I can't say things like this because I know nothing about it. But I just read what the Lord says. And he said, teach you young women to be obedient to your own. The next word there is own. You're obedient to everybody's husband except your own. You ex you're obedient to the side chick. You're obedient to the deputy. I got it here, no? Oh. You, you, you're obedient to... I ain't start this morning's message yet, huh? I'm giving you a recap for you people who would not come to church. Taking it as a joke. Don't understand that the Lord could come with you on overtime. I'm just reminding you, because that's my job. To be obedient to their own husbands, why is the Lord making this demand? That the word of God be not evil spoken of. The word of God ought to be lifted up. When people look at you, they ought to see Christ. Now, I feel like I go, want to go on some more. Pardon me, you those of you who have been here for the last four services. You're hearing this for the fourth time. I don't know where Americans get their statistics from. But they say you don't begin to understand the message unless you've heard it 29 times. I don't know where they get that figure from. But I know you don't hear everything the first time. The second time, as a matter of fact, I'm going to say things this morning. that Although you heard this already, that you have not heard. And what? If you hear it ten times, what's wrong with that? You listen to the Calypso on the radio? Hear it over and over and over and over? We want to get it into your heart. But, 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 but let me go on from here and show you that if you're looking for the Lord, if you are, if you are um, uh, in verse 9 of chapter, chapter 2, if you are an employee... You got to be you got to be obedient to your boss. Obedient to him? You know who you're talking about, Pastor? Yeah. I know who you're talking about. The one that employed you. The one that didn't call you. The one that you dressed nicely and went into his office and begged for the job. But now you get in there, you own the people place. No, 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 it can't work like that. You your employee, 
In those days, that word servant meant slaves. People say Paul didn't address slaves. Paul addressed slaves. He said them to be obedient to your own masters. The time is going to come, he said in another scripture, when you see the chance to be liberated, then take your liberty. But until then, don't go get shot, like Bossa or somebody like that. Get to work early. Spend an hour for lunch. Don't go in the bathroom when you should be working, sit down on the toilet, doing your WhatsApp. You're not getting paid for that. And above everything else, don't put your Bible in the front where everybody can see it. The boss didn't employ, employ you to read your Bible. He employed you to work. And when you put your Bible there, and my best client is a Muslim, he gone. And I ain't implying you to run my customers. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God, the real holy Pentecostals does have a little Bible right there by the cash register. I ain't implying you to do that. I ain't implying you to do My best customer is a Muslim or Hindu or something. So you know what? When you get home in your own room, you read your Bible there. But until then, while you're on my job, you put your Bible in your bag and read it at lunchtime. Amen. Praise the Lord. Preach, Pastor. Amen. Servants, obey your own masters and please them well in all things. Make your boss be satisfied with you in all things. And look at that. No back talking. I love the Bible, you know, I love the Word of God. But that's not all. He said, I could say some more about that. But he went on and he talked to different people. He talked to young men and he talked to young women, things that they should do. And they're doing this as they're looking for the coming of the Lord. Look, I've been in church for 70 years now. That's a long time. I know you only look like 17, but believe me, I've been in church for 70 years. I've seen the good, bad, and the ugly. I've been pastor for nearly 40 years. I've seen it. And believe me, brethren... If what I'm seeing today are people that are looking for the coming of the Lord, I tell you, I myself must be living in la-la land. I don't see the effort. I don't see the commitment. I don't see the loyalty. So that when you stand before God and God says, depart from me, I never knew you. You can start arguing now. Lord, I went to Pegwell Church every Sunday morning. Lord, I used to preach every message. Lord, I gave my body to be burned and that, that. The Lord said, get out my face. I never knew you. Why? You had no personal relationship with him. So this morning, I'm telling you, have a personal relationship with the Lord because he's coming soon. Let me give you a scripture a little bit. I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 21. I think it might be verse 8. No, not verse 8. He says, I just want to confirm what I'm saying. Where the Lord said, behold, I am coming quickly. Behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me. So there's some rewards for living this life, for going through the hardships. Andrew, Andrew, can you unplug your mic? I'm hearing you. Um, Revelation 21. Behold, I come quickly, let me tell you it. And my reward is with me. To give every man, everybody can stand before God, according as his work shall be. He's coming. So those of you who are hearing me online, and you have this nonsense, but I can't go to church because all the pastor wants is money, and all the pastor wants is big house and big car. Look at this again. You are going to give an account to God to give every man according as his work shall be. God is going to judge you according to your work. Nobody here is going to be judged according to my work. Whatever you do, God is going to judge you. So stop this nonsense, but I can't go to church because of this. And I can't go to church because of that. Because God is going to judge you for his, according to your own work. Amen? He's coming soon. Let me get into today's message, which is going to tell you that you need to fight. You need to struggle. You need to contend. If you have in your heart, if you have any inkling in your mind, of what hell is going to be like. A place where Jesus said. We put this on the screen. The place where the worms don't die. A place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. A place where there's no parole. 
You don't spend a hundred years and then get parole. You are there forever ad infinitum. You are there forever if you miss the rapture that I'm talking about here this morning. You don't have any chance to go back and make correction. This is not the Roman Catholic Church. There's no purgatory. The Bible doesn't speak anything about purgatory. When you die, you die. Yeah? The Lord said there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you yourself is thrown out. You're not thrown out to the new Sam Lawrence Hotel. You know, I understand it's great. I understand it's wonderful. The new Sam Lawrence Castle Hotel. But when you get thrown out, you're not going there. You're not going on holiday. We are going to bring up this one where it says that the fire is not quenched, the worm death not, and the fire is not quenched. And that is not just for a year or two or five or ten. That is there forever. So I'm here this morning to tell you, you need a fight. Let me use as my anchor text this morning. <laughs> they have a devil, devil is. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. I want to get your attention because the Lord said in Jeremiah chapter 33, Pastor, could you take them? Pastor, I set you as a watchman. So I'm a watchman, huh? He said, when you see the thief coming and you don't open your mouth and the thief comes and captures and kills my people, they will die in their sin because they don't have a chance to repent. But their blood, I'm going to require at your hand, Pastor. Can you bring that up for me? Jeremiah 33. Ezekiel, eh? Ezekiel 33, I think. Or Ezekiel 3. But if you see the sword coming, and you open your mouth and you begin to bellow and holler and shout like I'm doing now. And the enemy comes and takes them away in their sin. My blood will not be on your hand because you've done your part. So that's what I'm here doing this morning. We seem to be fighting the losing battle as pastors. We've lost 50% or more of the congregation worldwide. People are more concerned to be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And so it will seem as though the church is on the back burner and on its way down. Let me warn you that it's not so. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. God always has something up his sleeve. And they keep wondering all the time, who's going to come with next? Who's going to come with next? Take them. What is going, I want that when you come back, but take it down for a little bit. What is going to come with next? Look what happened at the, at the, at the Paris uh, opening ceremony. People thought that they would mock the Passover. Huh? And where you normally have Jesus with John leaning on his breast and they're before a big table with the bread and the wine. The French people decide that they're going to mock that and they made it their own. But the persons were homosexuals. Another homosexual was pretending as Jesus. And it was really blasphemy against God. Uh, that, that's what came up. That's all those homosexuals blasphemy. There's another one before that too. Before you have this joke in the front. But that turned out, this is what it looks like. But as you know, the picture, you know, it's not like that. But all those homosexuals are blaspheming God. And they thought that, ah, we won. I tell you, Jesus always has something of his sleeve. As a result of that, people who don't even know Jesus are complaining about it. People who are not Christians all over the world, people got the opportunity to hear about Jesus just because of that, what they did. The Lord always has a way. Of getting, I don't know what he's going to come up with next. But he said something in his word that I'm puzzled about. He said that the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. I don't know if he's going to get that done, but he doesn't lie. He doesn't lie. And I would love to be around to see that. All the Muslim territories and Hindus and all that. All, every knee is going to bow to our Lord Jesus. But look at our text this morning in Romans chapter 8 and, and verse 18. Paul said to the Romans, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Brethren, when you read that scripture, 
it is worthwhile to say no to sin. Because there's such glory coming. Every time I get to this, and I want to get higher than this, but every time I get to this, I always think of worldly presentations where they have the, the Miss Universe. Man, that is splendiferous. When you look in the room and look at the things that, the, 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 you listen to the sound and you listen to the pyrotechnics and all that kind of stuff, it is really great. The color, it, it, is, it is awesome. All the Emmys and all that, look at the room that they're in and you, you think that you're dying and going to heaven. Man, when Jesus comes, all that's going to pale in, in significance. When the glory of God is revealed, you're going to be happy that you fought the good fight. You're going to be happy that you sat down here while I keep barking at you all the time. You're going to be happy that I took time to do what I do. Somebody said it will be worth it all. When I see Jesus, it will be worth it all when I see him. So let me bravely run this race. Let me read this again. And I'm going to read this in about two or three translations. All right? We're going to be picking at this for the whole week. Paul said, I reckon. Reckon means to place to an account. It's an accounting term. I can't see it now, but I reckon that the sufferings of this present time. I don't think nobody in front of me here should ever be talking about suffering. When you compare it to what's happening across Africa and certain places, especially places where Muslims rule. We ain't suffering. Are we suffering? People getting their heads chopped off for the gospel. Churches blown up. Take down, take down, because they're not listening to me. Huh? Women raped. People hungry. No shelter. Young people. No education. You know, Afghanistan is a lady. You can't go to school. There's sufferings in this world that I really don't even want to talk about now. But despite all the suffering, even if you were suffering, listen to what Paul said in that verse. Scripture, scripture people, listen to what Paul said. He said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, man, when you stand before God, I hope you understand that punishment in hell is not equal for everybody. I hope you know that punishment is not equal for everybody. Huh? The Bible said, they who knew good and did it not, we put that scripture, hold the scripture, I'm coming back to that, but listen to this one. They that do know to do good and do if it not, you know to do good, but you don't do it, shall be beaten with many stripes. But they who did not know will be beaten with how many? Let's read it. That servant which knew his Lord's will. If you come into this church for one day, you know the Lord's will. And prepared not himself, neither did according to God's will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But look at the next verse. But he that knew not. If you come in here one time, you could never tell God you knew not. I make sure that you know. If you're visiting with us this morning, you know. There's no no not for you today. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of a beating shall be beaten with what? Few stripes. It's not equal. It's not equal. There are certain parts of hell that are hotter and reserved for some people like Hitler and people like that. But listen, let me continue this. For, which means because, unto whomsoever much is given, you are given much. Pegwell Community Church is given much. Of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. That is why the world talks about the church. Because they ask for more from us. They have put a trust in us. When anything happens in the country, they say, call the church. COVID, what happened to the church? Shootings, what happened to the church? Because they put a sort of confidence in us. And from us, they will ask the more. I want to read this in the New Living Translation. Because some of you wouldn't come to church, wouldn't serve God properly and whatever. And although the rapture is just around the corner, I'm not seeing any changes. Thank God for the 50 faithful that come during the week. But Pastor, I go to work. All right, work if you want to work. 
Then you stand before God and say, I, I had to work. And a servant who knows what the master wants, like you do, but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions, will be severely punished. But look at the next. And a servant who, uh, but someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. When someone has been given much, much will be required in, in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. That's what the Lord says. So let me go back again to Romans 8, 18, but let me read this in the New Living Translation. We are not suffering, really. We have a little need here and there. Read it. Yet, what we suffer now is nothing, to, is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. I studied this message this week. And I made some personal decisions. There are some things that I did before. I ain't doing no more. I mean some ungodly things. How many know the pastor does ungodly things? So you know that? You know you can hate somebody like anybody else? You know you can get, I nearly said pissed off, but you can't say that from the pulpit. So you, <laughs> you know you can get really upset with people, people who scandal your name and people, you, you, you know that the pastor just like you. But I determined these days, I've made a new commitment. Um, the songwriter said, Am I a soldier of the cross? A follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause? Or blush to speak his name? By like verse 2. Must I be carried to the skies? On flowery beds of ease? While others fought to win the prize? And sail through bloody seas? We want to go to heaven. But we don't want to fight. We want to part light. Into the pearls of glory. We want to be, we, we, we want to be raptured. Like, like, beam me up, Spock. Beam me up. So the Lord is going to beam us up to glory. We don't want to fight. We don't want to contend. We don't want to wrestle. Huh? We don't like adversity. We don't like calamity. Catastrophe. We don't like danger and difficulty. We don't like disaster. We don't like discomfort. We don't like grief or hazard or injury or misery or misfortune or oppression. Those are foreign words to us. That is for somebody that's not for me. We don't like peril, persecution. We don't like sorrow. We don't like suffering. We don't like trouble. We don't like torment. We don't like worry. You see those 21 words that I just called there? Every one of them will find their way in your life. And if you don't know how to be strong in the Lord... What do you think the Lord says in Hebrews 10, verse 25, that we should come together? The devil wants to divide and conquer. Those of you who used to use the coal pot know that when you take out a piece of coal and put it one side, it goes out. Give me an amen if you know what I'm talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about. You're too young. You know the, you know the coal? Huh? Just put it one side. That's what the devil wants. So he gives you all kinds of excuses. As to why you can't come to church. The Lord said we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I have never met a people in my life that find so many excuses to go to hell. Is it that you don't understand what hell is like? Is it, is it that you hate what heaven is like? People make all kinds of excuses to go to hell. I, I don't understand that. Don't forsake yourself. The assembling. You see the word assembling? That's about, I told you before a million times. Let me tell you a million and one. They tell me it takes about 3,000 parts to make a car. If you go down to NASCO and they have 3,000 parts in the bond house, they ain't got the car. They got all 3,000. They got all the washers. They got all this. and all. They ain't got the car until you assemble it. Until you assemble it, you don't have a car. So the Lord uses a good word there. So somebody say, watch on Zoom. So one Zoom is in St. Lucie, and you're watching me in St. Lucie, another one watching in St. Philip, the other one watching in St. Joseph, and the other one watching in St. John. That's something you look at assembly. That car is going to shackle out on the road. Can't even get together. So we should, we should come to church. I've been begging you for a long time. I've been saying, no, no, it's no begging you to come to church. But one of these days, we're going to stand before God. Let me show you. Let me show you. 
I'm going to show the unjust, the unjust judgment. Revelation chapter 20. I'm going to begin at verse 14. I'm going to show what's going to happen if you don't serve God properly. If you don't fight this good fight of faith. If you don't realize that you're going through some hardship now. But it is worthy for you to go through it. Because the glory that is coming. The glory that is coming. But let's go back some more. Make me verse 11. Let me show. This is the ungodly. There are going to be two judgments when the Lord comes. There's going to be one called the Bema Seat. B-E-M-A. The Bema Seat. That's for the godly people. The Christians. We are not going to be judged for sin there. We're going to be judged for works. But a person who doesn't serve God. This is what's going to happen. You're going to stand before the great white throne. So there are two judgments. There's the great white throne judgment. And there's the Bema Seat judgment. If you're, if you're saved, you're judged at the Bema Seat. If you're unsaved, you go to the white throne. So the Lord is so good, he tells us what it's going to be like. Let me read it for you. And I saw a great white throne. And I saw him that sat on it. Take down. Look. When people go to court these days, they treat the judge as a joker. I had a pastor friend who was speeding. He didn't think he was speeding. He went to, jail, went to court. Pastor charged, um, not pastor, judge charged me $120. He looked at the judge and said, you talking to me? I ain't paying none. The pastor, you know, I ain't paying none. They should have locked him up. You see these minibus men? They behave the same way. They don't care about the judge or the magistrates. You charge me $10,000, I came with $10,000 in my pocket. I go in the office and I paid and I go back and start doing the same nonsense all over. Not with this judge here. Look at him. Look at this judge. Not with this. You don't mess around with this judge. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11. I saw a great white throne and I saw him that sat on it. He was so awesome that uh, from his face the earth and the heaven fled away. They couldn't even behold his face. It was stern and stern is a, is a feeble way of describing how God's face was. And there was found no place for them. No one stay in front of God. But, and even the moon, sorry, the earth and the heaven got away from there. That's, that's how this court is going to be. You don't, you don't swagger in there and pay your fine and swagger back out. It doesn't work like that. Even the earth and the heaven fled away. And look what it says in the next verse 12. And I saw the dead. That's how I know you're coming back. I saw small and great. Small in money, great in money. Small in education, great in education. Small in size, great in size. Small in house, great in house. Small in car, great in car. I saw the dead, small and great stand before God. You are going to stand before God one these days. Hope that it is not here at the white throne judgment. Let's hope that it is at the beam of seat. And look at this. The books were open. Brethren, God is a writing, a writing, a writing all the time. God is a writing. The books were open, but another book was open called the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. If you're not scared, read the next four words for me. So you watch people and think because people are hypocrite, you are serving God. You're going to be judged according to your own works. But in the finish there, look at the next verse. You're before God now. The sea gave up the dead. So if you were eaten by a shark, you're coming back. If you were cremated and your dust was sprinkled over the Caribbean Sea, it coming back together. So the, de the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the death which were in them. Because don't forget that hell is not your final place if you don't know the Lord. The lake of fire is the final place. But right now hell is just a holding place. So hell is going to deliver them up. And they're going to come before God to be judged. Every man, read it. Every man, read again. I ain't going to care because the pastor is a hypocrite. I ain't going to church because all he wants is money. I ain't going to church. You better shut your mouth up. You're going to be judged according to your own works, people. But let me, it didn't finish there yet. And death and hell, because death is the final enemy. Nobody's going to die after this. Death and hell were cast where? Into the lake of fire. And what does it say? The first one is when you go up to Christ Church, Power Church. This is the second one. But it doesn't finish there. Let's go on. Let's go on. And whosoever, <laughs> I like those words. That includes you, you know. That includes you. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was what? Is God a liar? Is he going to change his mind when you come before him? Is he going to change his mind to accommodate you? Is he giving you the opportunity now to do the right thing? But are you doing it? 
I ain't hear nobody now. Catch you there. I ain't hear nobody. Whosoever, whosoever could be your grandmother. It could be our beloved prime minister. It could be the excellent man called Donald Trump. Shut up. Don't talk in class. No, no talking. No talking. Huh? It could be the Pope. That say the Bible is too old for modern people. He writes in the new Bible. You know he said that? He writes in the new Bible. The old, how are you going to make that old thing to deal with more? He going to hell if he doesn't change. Huh? And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was what? Cast into the lake of fire. Why are we fooling around and messing around when we only got one chance? So Romans 8 and 18 says, I reckon that the sufferings, sufferings of this present time, so you are going to go through some sufferings. You're going to go through some suffering. Brethren, I'm going to bring, oh, we have a lot of time. Uh, is my watch free? There's no half past 11. Am I right? Oh, good, good, good. Let me tell you that heaven is a real place. Heaven is a real place. Heaven isn't a state of mind. Heaven isn't a state of being. Heaven is not a place where you float around like a ghost. Heaven is a real place. When Jesus ascended from earth, he ascended into heaven. And the Bible says that he should descend from heaven. I'm going to give you some scripture. Heaven is a real place. I just talked to you about hell. Let me talk to you about heaven. It's a real place. There will be streets there. There will be water there. There will be homes there. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. There are animals there. When Jesus comes, you know you come on four, you hear about the four horsemen. They're coming on horses. There are going to be plants there. The Bible gives a good indication, like in Revelation chapter 1, about what heaven is like. Listen, man, when you get to heaven, you will wish that you were punished some more and persecuted some more and troubled some more. About six months ago, I got some cataracts taken off my eyes. Huh? And then I came to church two days later. And when I saw the color in this place, I couldn't believe that's what I was missing all the time. I wish I had gone and got the cataracts off six years ago. The color in this place, I heard people talk about how beautiful this place was. And I say to myself, well, it's just a gimmick. But when I walked at the door and I saw red, so red. And blue, so blue. And green, so green. And when I traveled around, I look at the trees and I, I was seeing something different. Brother, that's going to be like when you get to heaven. That's going to be when you, you, you are going to be so glad that you made it. You'll be so glad that you resisted the sin that you love so much. You're going to be so glad that you obeyed the word of God. I don't have words enough to persuade you that, you, that, you're, going to be, that you're going to be so excited. I don't know. Excited is just a foolish word. Scriptures tell us that the Father so says. Let me, let me give you some scripture about heaven. Yeah? Matthew 25 verse 34. NIV. Matthew 25 34. Heaven is a real place. You're going to be glad that you got there. Fight the good fight of faith. Matthew 25 34. 34. Listen to this. And the NIV. Then the king will say to those on his right, because Jesus is going to come and divide the nations. We'll get to that sometime. He put the goats on the left and the sheep on the right. Then he will say to those on the right, come, you who are the blessed of my father. How many of you want to hear that? Come, those of you who are the blessed of my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That, those, that are those on the right. But look at verse 35. It should speak to those on the left. But he said, fire was hungry, etc., etc. But then he goes on to those on the left. Could you give me that verse? He's going to speak to the left. And he's going to tell the ones on the left to depart. There's either before or after. Then he will say to those on his left, Brother, which side are you going to be on? You're going to still continue to be so rebellious and ungodly. Don't forget, I'm not only talking to you, but if you are, Sorry, but I'm speaking to other people other than you. I'm speaking to hundreds of people. 
I might be speaking to people in New York who are always waiting for these messages tomorrow morning, but we can't get them out. I don't know why. So I may not be speaking to you, but if I am, I'm not apologizing. He will say to those on this life, depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal. Are you listening to me? Are you talking? Eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Eternal fire. Whether you don't want to miss the rapture and you don't want your pet poodle to be in this eternal fire. Because that pet poodle is going to be there forevermore. Sometimes I wish that the spirit of slap would come upon me. To slap you alongside the head when I see that you're not doing the right things. And behaving as though it's normal. Anybody know the spirit of slap? That's, that's not from the Lord. Huh? That's from me. Matthew 6 20. Store up treasures in heaven. We are moth and rust cannot destroy. And thieves do not break through and steal. Heaven is a real place. When Stephen was being stoned, the Bible said he looked into heaven. And in heaven, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Now, the Bible tells us that when Jesus ascended into heaven, he was seated at the right hand of the Father. But now Stephen is being stoned. Be careful how you treat God's servant. Huh? Now Stephen is being stoned, and God stands up. Jesus stands up in heaven. Heaven is a real place. Hebrews 13 and verse 14. For this world is not our home. We are looking forward to our everlasting home in heaven. That's the, the, the living Bible, the TLB. Uh, this is Hebrews 13 and 14. For here we have no continuous city, but we look for one that is to come. Let me, let me, let me start you off now as I stop here. Let me show you some things that although they may seem hard now, you're going to be glad if you went through this. You're going to be glad that somebody talked your name and you were able to build resistance. You know, at one time, the Lord told a man to push a one-ton stone that was in front of his house. One ton. And the man pushed and pushed day after day, week after week, month after month. And he said to the Lord, but Lord, they're pushing this all the time. Anything they move? They didn't move it still the same place. The Lord said, whoever told you something about moving, look at your muscles. Look at your muscles and see how they're going. You pushing, you think you were wasting time because you didn't see the stone move. But those muscles really develop a lot. You are fighting and contending and struggling. And you think nothing is happening. No, our God is not like that. Our God is a rewarder, finish it for me, of them that diligently seek him. Amen? So Paul is going to give us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, begin at verse 23. I'm going to show you what Paul went through. Don't get jealous of Paul. When Paul wrote... Uh, uh, half of the New Testament. Don't get jealous of Paul. Paul went through some things that you wouldn't want to go through. There are some things that are minor in your life. You get miserable. You don't want to go through. Let me show you what Paul went through. I'm just going to read them. Not really explain too much right now. But Paul was talking about people who came in the ministry. Like some today who come in the ministry. They're self-appointed. Nobody appointed in ministry. They walk up one morning and decide they can open the church and I'm a pastor. There are others who come to churches, fall out with the preacher, and go open the church, self-appointed. Then there are those like Jezebel in the church. Paul, I mean, the Lord wrote to one of the churches and said, you allowed that woman who calls herself a prophetess. So some people call themselves whoever they want to call themselves. Nowadays, you don't know who's a bishop from an apostle from a pastor. You can call me pastor and if you feel like doing that, you can say, hey, you... I will understand you, Mimi. Names ain't, got, names ain't got nothing to do with me. I ain't looking for an apostleship or anything like that. I just want to serve the Lord. And I want to enter into this glory. Aren't you? So Paul said, they think they're ministers because they went down to a bought a Bible and attached a case. Let me show you what makes you a minister. Look at these. I'm speaking all negative things now, which you don't want to go through. 
He said, I speak as a fool. I shouldn't be really saying this because I don't boast. That's what he's saying. But in this situation, bear with me as I tell you a few things. In labors, more abundant than all them fools that saying that they're pastors. In stripes, which means beatings, above measure. I had more beatings than you could shake a stick at. At one time I was beaten and left outside of the city for dead. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He goes on. In prisons, more frequently. You haven't been to prison yet? You only prison? In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, often. You know how many times he was at the point of death? Even in Acts chapter 27 that we're going to probably talk about tonight. When he had that storm that they couldn't see the sun for two weeks. If you don't see the fridge for two days, you're going to faint. Ask you to fit to fast for two days, and you can't see the fridge, and, 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 and your eyes are rolling up, and you got all sorts of stuff that you got to go see the doctor about. This man didn't see the sun for two weeks, and he was in a tempestuous storm. Listen, don't let me talk about those words, tempestuous, because we don't know what we're talking about. A little hurricane plays about here. I don't want to say a little hurricane because a lot of people suffer, but I want to, in comparison to what Paul had to go through and what other people got to go through, he goes through nothing. And labor is more abundant. In prisons, I went to prison so often. Most of his letters in the New Testament were written from prison. Uh, of the Jews, I received 40 stripes, 39 stripes, five times. Multiply how many stripes I got from the cat and nine tail on my back. And you wouldn't even make an effort to come to church because you get home late. You wouldn't make an effort to come to church because the music too loud. You ought to be glad to have some. You will make an effort to come to church because I got to work overtime. And having come to church, having come to church, you just stay there. No excitement. No effervescent. No fire. Just there. Where the no man. You can't imagine what the glory is going to be like. If you could barely imagine what that glory is going to be like, this ser service would change tonight. Huh? He said, three times I was beaten with rods. But before that, in verse 24, he said, from the Jews, his own fellow people, he received five times 40 lashes minus one. Five times 39. That's what he got with the cat nine tail. Three times he was beaten with rods. Verse 25, once he was stoned. Three times he suffered shipwreck. This is what Paul went through. Tell me, were you ever went through for Jesus? Tell me what adverse thing you have ever gone through. And you think that when you stand before God, he's not going to judge you harshly? To whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, much is required. But let me continue here. A night and a day, I was up there floating in the water. A night and a day. This ship to pass by and rescue me. Paul out there floating in the water by himself. But he, more than that, in journeys, because he didn't have the corolla, to, he had to walk. Paul walked so many miles, verse 26, in journeys often. I can't even get you to walk from here up the street to handle the track. I can't get you to walk from here down to Iceland to handle the track. But you're on your way to glory. Oh, yeah? Really? In perils, the word perils could speak of difficulties. In perils in the waters. In perils of robbers, he was robbed. In perils by my own countrymen, those are the ones that come against you. In perils by the ungodly, he was always in trouble. In perils in the city, if he went in Bridgeton, he had trouble. In perils in the wilderness, he decided, I'm not going to see that going to the wilderness, he had trouble there. In perils in the sea, where are you going to go now? You went to the city, you went to the wilderness, now he is in, in the sea and trouble all the time. And you want a light life. Two drops of rainfall. We got a million dollar building here that don't leak. But you can't get here. But you could get to the hospital. You could get to the hospital if you get sick. Or you could get to the airport if you're going up to over and away to New York. You could get there with the same rain. But God has been so good to give us. And let me tell you something. As long as I'm alive, the door's going to be open all the time. Right? Six people got keys, but none of them all come to open. So I could keep opening all the time. Because you don't have any excuse. You don't have any excuse that uh, the doors are closed. But yeah, I go on. In perils among false brethren, hear false brethren talk in them and tell lies on you. Somebody informed the person, the people in Parish Land this morning, that we don't have any church today. Who could do that? 
I maybe don't have any power. I passed through there, just happened to pass through. I saw one of the children in this. I said, you ready for church? He said, no, we got the service. I said, what? The whole wicked person would do like that. In perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness. I went through trouble in the sea. In perils among false brethren. Not everyone that comes to church is genuine. False brethren. Then now he comes to his body in verse 27. I was in weariness, painfulness. I had to keep watching all the time. You remember the time when the king said, we are not going to go sleep until we kill Paul? I remember they had to let him down over, over a, a wall in a basket. Anybody know Donald? Yeah. Tell the truth. Let me get some beer, John. What you went through for God? What you ever went through? And expect to have the same glory that he had? Huh? Look at this. In watchings often, in hunger and thirst. Yeah, Paul was hungry sometimes. He was thirsty sometimes. In fastings often. With S -I -D, in fastings often. Look, in cold and nakedness. Not that he walked around naked, but he didn't have the clothing to keep him warm. Huh? Besides that, besides all of that, the care that come upon me daily looking after all the churches. Because he established the Corinthian church, the Ephesian church, the Galatian church, the Philippian church, the Thessalonian church. All those churches he established and he had to supervise all them. And then he went on to say in verse 29, who then is weak? Am I not weak? Who is offended? But I, I don't worry about it. Verse 30, if I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern my infirmities. And then he said that the grace of God may rest upon me. What have you gone through? What have you gone through? Romans 8, 18, King James Version. I keep my mind set on the coming of the Lord. It's going to be glorious. Nothing that we could do on earth. I'm looking to see what the closing ceremony for the Olympics is going to be like. It's the worst I've ever seen in the years. But even that will not be as spectacular. You watch the dropping of the ball, Macy's ball, on all year's night, on New Year's morning, spectacular. This coming of the Lord is going to put that, that, that's going to pale. So Paul said, I hope you can see this. For I reckon that the suffering, not the glory, not the joy, the suffering, his glory and his suffering, he said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, suffering. He, another place, he said, I will glory in my infirmities. We always want to glory in having a picnic. And Paul said, I would glory in my infirmities. The reckon, I reckon that the suffering of this present time ain't worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us when Jesus comes. So what are you going to do about it? Be slipshotted all the time in the way you serve the Lord. No effervescence. No happiness and joy. No obeying the scripture out there in the highways and hedges which the Lord tells us to do. If you are, if you are, if you are satisfied that this place is really going to be what the Lord says, you will try to get all your family in. All your workmates, you'll be telling them about Jesus. But because you are not fully persuaded yourself. This doesn't mean anything to you. The sufferings of this present life. So you're going to have to fight. Tonight we're going to be talking about fighting the good fight. You're going to have to struggle. You're going to have to contend. You're going to have to run. All of those call for energy. All those call for determination. All those call for commitment. All those call for loyalty. It doesn't just happen like that. Fighting, wrestling, running, contending. Have you started any of that yet? Have you started any of that yet? Let's all stand. I'm going to give you the opportunity to talk to the Lord. If anybody feel you need some strength, you want to come up to the altar for five minutes. You're not going to spend more than five minutes and probably have somebody lay hands on you or whatever. Let's all stand. If you do not have a local assembly, feel free to join us for an exhilarating time of worship. Our services are Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening, Healing and Deliverance at 6.30 p.m. Join us in prayer on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. and for Bible study on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Let's fellowship and enjoy. The simplicity of the gospel.